when I was called to come and talk about the book this evening, it, actually I wasn't asked, I was told. So somebody sent me a uh, text message said, this book, we want you to discuss it at Radical Books. And I said yes immediately, not because uh, I thought the book was exciting. I was more excited about being a Radical book, and I'll tell you why. Um, <clears throat> Uh, last Sunday I attended 49. Uh, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because I grew up in the age of Nanso in the 80s, not this current Nanso. Who's a Nanso member, by the way? Right now? Nanso members? Leadership of Nanso now? No? Good for you, because they are rubbish. <laughs> now, the Namibian National Students Organization in the 80s was uh, was a very radical organization. There are so many people, I can give you examples of people who were the founder members of NANSO, who, who become very prominent Namibian citizens. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning NANSO is for one particular reason. When we grew up in the 80s, when we were in school, a lot of the books, if not all the books that you are reading here tonight, before independence would have been banned, there were there was a particular notorious law uh, during the apartheid era which banned books which they considered reactionary or radical. Now, <clears throat> I remember the very first book that I read which was banned was a book about Steve Biko. It was called The Dry White Season. They eventually went and made a movie about it starring Denzel Washington. The second book I read uh, was the autobiography of Malcolm X. Now, what happened is every chapter of Nanso throughout the country used to get a copy of a book. Let's say we get a book. Uh, the Fatima Mir uh, had a book about Nelson Mandela. Uh, and we saw a copy of that. And the late Johnny Otto had a book called Battlefront Namibia, and we had a copy of that. Now, what happened in Nanso, if a particular chapter was given a book, you were basically given two days to read that book because you had to pass it on to other people. As a result, if there's like three or four of you in a chapter, you had one day or a day and a half to read the book. And you had to read the book. Not only did you have to read the book, we used to debate the contents of the book after they said, you didn't want to be the idiot who did not, who did not finish reading the book. As a result, uh, it, it has taught me to speed read. At some point, we used to read up to five books a month. Not only did we read the books, we used to debate these books. I'm mentioning this for two reasons. One is to say, what Radical Books is doing is, 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 is really radical, it is, it's, a, it's a great thing that you are doing this and I'm encouraging you to do this, but most importantly is please read these books and, and, and have debates about it. Uh, there's so many things that are happening in our country right now and I really get tired when I hear people saying, oh, black people don't read, oh, the youth doesn't read, oh, young people do not read. I really think you don't have any excuse to read. I, I remember um, reading a book about Frederick Douglass, who, who was a civil rights leader, was an evolutionist in the 1700s in the United States. And, he, and his biography, in, a, in his autobiography, he wrote that slaves used to be killed if they were found reading. It was against the law for black slaves to know how to read or to be literate, to, read, to know how to read and write. So I just want to say that as an introduction and say, please, people have died. I know you hear this a lot. People have died for you to have the privilege to read. People have died for you to have the right to read, so please, there's no excuse for us not to read. Now, to come to this book, uh, Stella Bosch Mafia by Peter Dutoy, I read this book um, basically in, in two days. Uh, not because I'm a fast reader, but because it's, it's such an easy read. I basically read the book for two reasons. One. I'm intrigued by how Africans have managed to amass so much wealth. Uh, and secondly, I read this book called uh, The Super Africanus. If you haven't read that book, please do yourself a favor 
and read that book. It was about the formation of the Afrikaner Bruder Bond. The Afrikaner Bruder Bond started as, as a secret society for Afrikaners. It's basically, they, they were an organization that was formed to infiltrate the entire South, white South African society from business, from education, from agriculture, all the way to, to even religion and sport. And I will talk a little bit about the Bruder Bond uh, later, but let me just talk to you about what I read about this book. Uh, the book is not an exciting book. It's not really, you don't read the book and you go, wow, this is what's happened. Because a lot of the stuff that, that's written in the book has been, have, have been captured before, before. But what was, what was amazing to me about reading the book, and especially about the so-called Stellenbosch Mafia, and I'll talk about Stellenbosch in a minute, in, in, in a while, is how, Peter, where you're sitting right now, 90% of the things that you're wearing, in fact, even the chair you might be sitting on, is manufactured and owned, or was owned, is owned by a company, is manufactured by a company owned by the Stellenbosch Mafia. These guys control everything from what we read, from what we see on TV, from what we eat, from what we are educated. This is, this is unbelievable, and this is where the, the, the Super Africanas is coming in. Let me give you an example, uh, just as a personal anecdote. About two years ago, I was on the farm, uh, and a friend of mine from South Africa came to visit me. He, he wanted to visit Namibia and came to stay with me. We visited the farm. Now, he works for APSA in what he calls the family branch of APSA. Now, the family branch of APSA, which he works for, he only deals with the accounts of super wealthy families. Right? As he was, on, as he was talking, as he, we were watching TV, and then he got this phone call, and he had to take the phone call. And then, uh, probably like an hour later, he came back and he was very stressed. And I said, what are you stressed about? And he said to me, but uh, he, obviously because he, he, deals, he deals with super wealth, uh, private wealth, he, he doesn't disclose information. He'll just give you general broad strokes about what he's doing. And I said, why are you stressing about I said, he said to me, Lars, you don't understand. I have this client who's an African. He just made 800 million US dollars. And he doesn't know what to do with the money. And he's telling me, this guy is telling me, he needs to put this money away within the next seven days. So I was discussing with him, I was discussing with him the various options of what he can do with the money. <laughs> and I just started laughing. I said, what, this brother has got what? <laughs> He said, no, he's got an 800 million US dollar problem. <laughs> Why do we all want to have that problem? <laughs> we have the opposite problem. We have the problem we do not have the 800 million. And anyway, so he told me, but Lazarus, this is, this is nothing. I said, so how much is this guy worth? And he said to me, Lazarus, these are people who do not even appear on Forbes Rich List or Sunday Times Rich List. This guy's personal wealth is 22 billion South oh. American. Right? He's family. And I said, how old is this guy? He said, this guy is 52. Right? So, I asked him, what, do, what does this guy do? And this guy said, he's in, he said, this guy is in food production. And I said, come on. Give me a tip, man. Just a little thing. Because, you know, I'm a businessman. I also want to know how these guys make money. And he said, Lazarus, let me just give you an example. If you look at Top Score or if Visa, Maze Meal, and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. These guys, they have seven farms in South Africa. And they provide 70% of the grain that's produced in South Africa. Who consumes that grain? Black people. And these guys basically are in control of the South African national food security. And he has that problem, and he inherited that business from his father. Now, reading the, the, 
the book about the Stellan Bosch Mafia. Let me just tell you very briefly what the book is all about. I have my own very suspicions about why this book was written. Because this book, it speaks about a lot of things. One thing that they are talking about is the fact that uh, of the top 100 companies on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the guys that have been discussing this book own seven of those companies. Right? Now, you say, okay, out of seven, you know, it's out of 107, it's nothing. Let me just break it down. 16 of the 100 JSE listed companies, three of them, of the companies they own, three of them are in the top 10. Seven of them are in the uh, top 30. And nine of them are amongst the prestigious top 40. Right? Uh, they, didn't, they don't own seven, sorry, they own 17 companies. Mm. Now, if you look at the, what they call the market capitalization of the Johannes Beck Stock Exchange, it's, it's trillions of dollars. Right? Just to give you a, a, a very, very simple example. One of the guys that they, they, they are discussing in detail is a guy called Johan Rupert. Johan Rupert is worth, personally, is worth 5.7 billion US dollars. Okay? He inherited his company from his father, Anton Rupert, who started the company in the 40s, Rembrandt. They started with cigarette. A lot of you are too young to remember. Rembrandt van Rijn, it was a cigarette, the cigarette company. These guys own everything. Everything that you can possibly think about that you consume from South Africa, they own. Let, let me break it down to you, and we'll bring it down to the super Africans. So when the Africaners came into power, they decided they are going to control the economy. So what they did, they said, first of all, our people need to have their own literature. Okay? So they started a company called Naspers. Naspers owned like Drum Magazine, Kier, Ace Edward, Multi-Choice. You know, every, most rare was all these African <laughs> news magazines, the Bild, Rapport, and all these things. They own that company. Naspers is so strong, their market capitalization right now, as we speak, is a hundred billion uh, South African dollars. <clears throat> right? They own companies like Pepco, Pep Stores, Ackermans, Jet, all these things that you guys like to post on Instagram, all those clothes. <laughs> <laughs> they own them. So what the Africaners did, they said, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to start a, a NASPER, a NASPER stands for uh, National Press, yeah? the National Press. So what they did is they took over the, the government service and they said this, for those of you who've been to FMNF, uh, FMNF, uh, AR talks, I spoke about this, so I'll just talk about it very, very briefly. So the Africaners came into power in, they actually came to power in 1648, but they actually cemented the apartheid in 1963. So what they did is, they realized that the Africaners, by their very nature, were peasants. They were uneducated people. By the time the Africaners came into power, 70% of their, of their population was illiterate, because they were farmers. It's where they name, name come from, boom, farmers. They were peasants, they were subsistence farmers. So what they did is, okay, we're gonna do two things. We know one thing, we know agriculture, so we're going to focus on agriculture. They started national colleges, they started technicals, and they started universities. And they said, okay, we are going to start banks so that we can bank our own money. So they started uh, what they called Foxcast, the, na the national chest. Foxcast later became APSA, right? So what the one smart thing the Africans did with the, with the public service, they said, every African that cannot be, that cannot, that is not smart academically, needs to have a career in the, in the public service. So what they did, they said, okay, when you, when you start grade one to grade, it's 12 now these days, okay, grade one to grade 12, if you pass with extinction, uh, distinction, 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 you can go to university. If you don't pass with distinction, you can go to a polytechnic. So you can do a diploma course or a degree course, which was fine. And what about the stupid Jan and Tommy? So they say if you are great, if you if you pass grade ten, which is at an A, you can go and work for the public service, or you can go to a vocational training center. Now, what about the guy who cannot go to the vocational training center who cannot work with their hands? Like they said, the guy who cannot, who's not academically gifted, they said. 
go and work for the public service. So that's what they did. They, they carved out a career for themselves. So when you finish grade 12, you're going to become, you start working as a clerk. Then after two years, you become a senior clerk. Two years after that, you become a chief clerk. Three years after that, you become a control officer. Two years after that, you become a senior control officer. And after that, you become a deputy di director. After deputy director, you become a director. And after that, you become a secretary, which was a political position. But they've timed it that from the age of 18 up to the age of 60, you would have a career in the public sense. So they said, OK. <clears throat> Now that our people can have a career in the public service, now that we started this university, what are we going to do? How are they going to bury themselves? They said, they started an insurance company and said, the minute you become a public servant, the minute you work for, the, for any African uh, institution, you need to take out a life insurance policy. So they formed an insurance company called uh, SANLAM. SANLAM stands for South African National Living Assurance Mats Campaign. Your son and number. <laughs> right? So they said now, they say, okay, these people, you then you get that disability benefit and things like that. And they said, wow, that is that is awesome. Now you have a career, you, you have insurance. So how are we going to do this? What how is, who's gonna bury these people? They formed a company called Afpo. Your Afpo. That buries our ministers and all. It's an Afrikaner company, guys. So what these guys did, this is to give you a background that they really uh, thought these things through. So and then what they did is they, they took Namibia, because they used to treat us like a ninth province of South, tenth province of South Africa or whatever. They took Namibia and South Africa and they divided it in, in, into uh, agricultural sectors. For example, they said, if you're in the Northern Cape, we only do small stock, sheep. If you're in the Western Cape, we only do like fruit, I mean, fruits, etc., etc. If you are in Mpumalanga in this area, you do maize and things like that. Namibia was just an incubation center for them. We took all our calves, our sheep, and all. Do you know that in Namibia in the 1940s and 50s, we used to produce grapes, which we used to ship to South Africa to complement uh, the, the Western Cape. Anyway, so that's, that's basically how, this, how these guys did it. Now, to come back to the book, the town of Stellenbosch, uh, the, the mafias that have been discussed here have one thing in common. They are all either educated at Stellenbosch, Stellenbosch University, or they live in Stellenbosch, or their businesses are based in Stellenbosch. Now, the book, the Stellenbosch Mafia is a bit of a, uh, a misnomer because these guys are not really a mafia because most of them don't like each other. They really cannot stand each other. They don't like each other. So it, it's actually not... Uh, it, it's not really a mafia. It's not like they sat together and they and they said, okay, guys, this is how we're going to take over this economy. No, they did not do that. But here's the thing. If you look at the, at the companies that are mentioned here, these guys owned Mediclinic, PSG Group, Pepcor, ShopRite, Capitec, FirstRent, Naspers. Now, if you're going to Google all these companies, you can see what they own. It's unbelievable. And that reminded me of a company called, uh, what is this company that does base here? Nam Namib Mills. Guys, do you know Namib Mills is owned by one guy? <laughs> Namib Mills and Feedmaster is owned by, uh, uh, I think it's Johan Fermat or something. One guy. Our national food security is one owned by one <laughs> South, white South African. <laughs> That's the guy who decides how much your price of maize is going to be in this country. Can you believe it? Right? So, now, what, what really drew me to this book is this. I personally think, this is just my review of the book, there's a guy they call Johann Rupert, which they are discussing at length in the book. I think he commissioned that book because if you look at Johann Rupert's book, uh, business uh, and you look at Naspers, for example, they are almost the same they have the same value, but the book speaks in detail about Johann Rupert. And Johann Rupert, I think, he, he, he's mentioning the book that he had a cordial, he had a very good relationship with Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was like a father figure to him. He talking about he had a very cordial relationship with Tabo Mbeki, but uh, Jacob Zuma hated him. 
because Jacob Zuma couldn't control him. Now, here's the thing. And this is where the crux of the matter is. Most of these books that are coming out of South Africa, and some of like the Jack Paul book and stuff like that, they deal with state capture. Now, what is so funny, Bill Pottinger, the, the PR company that was appointed to come and help the Guptas, they were brought by, to South Africa by Johan Rupert. And the Guptas hijacked them from Johan Rupert. And the Guptas are the ones who started exposing uh, Johan Rupert and his businesses, and they are the ones who came up with the expression called white monopoly capital. You know? So, and the whole book is all about Johan Rupert complaining and crying and moaning about how he's not seen, how he's not really recognized by the current government and things like that. So, my take on this book is this, and I want us to talk about this uh, probably during the <coughs> Q&A. As, as a Namibian entrepreneur, I read that book. When I finished reading the book, and I juxtaposed it to the Super Africana book that I read, and I realized that all of us here, all black people, this nonsense that we like to talk about, tenderpreneurs, the elite, you people are eating, we are fuck all <laughs> compared to these groups here. We are nothing. And who's from AR here so I can address you personally? Oh. Read this book. You see, when we're talking about the elite, and this is something I want to, and I don't want to bore you, but I really want you to read this book because it's very important for you to know how our livelihoods are controlled by a handful of people. So, two things came to my mind when I read this book and the previous book, and that's that nothing has changed for Africaners in this country. Talk about wealthy Africans. Nothing. At the dawn of, at the, at the, at the dawn of our independence, at the changes in South Africa in 1994, these super wealthy people did not have to apologize, atone, or pay for anything that they've done. Right? So what's the first thing that we do? <coughs> we are the first ones. We ignore Mr. The owner of Jets, Jets, Pep Stores, Capitec, APSA, and all of that. And then we focus on these so-called entrepreneurs. None of these, of, of these black people that, uh, and I was reading a very interesting article. Of all the companies that are listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, <laughs> only black people only have shares in three or seven percent. Seven percent. On a stock exchange, which is more, the market capitalization of more than a trillion, I think it's probably three trillion or something. And then we turn around and we start focusing on each other. Is that whole thing like, oh, we, we ignore the real enemy. And then we start focusing on each other. I am so happy this guy brought out this book because as a black person, I can learn and say, okay, you bastard. This is how you do it, right? So what we need to do is, you will read from this particular book and, and the previous book, because really, you, you can see that I said there was nothing major that I learned from this one. What Africaners did successfully, they took African nationalism. And they, they said they're gonna use their nationalism to build a country and an economy. We can't even, us, we can't even agree who's a Namibian. Because every day we need to remind ourselves, yeah, where were you in 1966? Yeah, so this you were brought in the family. Yeah, you see what I mean? <laughs> Africaners went through the same. Africaners were in concentration camps, guys. As Africaners were colonized by the British. They were in concentration camps during the anglo boer War. By 1963, they had a deliberate, deliberate program to empower Africaners and to make sure that subsequent generations of their people will not suffer. This is where you guys talk about white privilege. Let me just tell you, uh, before I conclude so we can start the Q&A session, here's the thing. <clears throat> There's this thing called the numerical majority and the political minority. Apartheid was a system <coughs> which was designed to, to exist in perpetuity. So, a white kid that's born during apartheid, grew up in a white neighborhood, went to a white school, 
white high school, white university, worked for a white camp. At home, his only interaction with black people was the cleaner and the gardener. At school, cleaner and gardener. At work, cleaner, gardener, and driver. At university, same thing. So what respect does he have for black people? Secondly, apart from the way it was created, white kids grew up feeling they were entitled to these things. This thing even, even becomes genetic. Like this kid just believed genetically I'm predisposed to wealth and well-being, right? So the Africans were the, they were, they were the political minority, majority, but they were the numerical minority. We were the political minority, but the numerical majority. We became independent. We are the political majority and the numerical, uh, uh, numerical majority. What have we done to show? What do we own, guys? When we talk to each other and tell us, I are the elite, you are eating, you are chopping, dead up in years. What, what do we own in this country? Let's bring it up. Who controls the food that we eat? Black people? Who controls the banks? Black people? Who controls where we live? Black people? What do we control? The law. What do we do for the what, what do we do with the law to help us? Zero. Please read that book. It will shock you. You, my brothers and sisters, are owned by the state of Russia. I thank you.